Hello, everyone, and welcome to the History DAO Decentralized Discourse. My name is Sky Harris. I'm CEO and co-founder of History DAO, and I'll be hosting the conversation today with a very special guest who is surely well known to all of you. He is founding editor and senior maverick of Wired Magazine, as well as an Olympic class oracle on the subject of how technology will impact our future. So, of course, I'm speaking of none other than Kevin Kelly. Um, history DAO is a huge fan of Mr. Kelly because of his seminal role in the history of the internet, the history of technology, and the history of the future. So thanks for joining me, Kevin Kelly. Hey, my pleasure to be here. Thanks for inviting me. I look forward to this. Awesome. All right. Uh, then if you're ready, let's begin. Sure. Okay. So I kind of wanted to start with um, maybe a little bit of like a test or a bit of a challenge to your very well-established, well-known optimism regarding um, mm -hmm. subject of technological development. So I guess maybe let me let me sort of put it this way um the rise and fall of great civilizations seems to correlate with the advent of various technologies um technologies for communicating for building for planting healing killing um, for transporting for calculating and maybe now even for thinking itself with the rise of ai um so considering the level of disruption potential that ai represents would you say as a techno optimist that it is actually uh, automatically a good thing because it is a kind of technology or what is the inherent good in such a technology as AI? That's a very profound question. Uh, in a certain sense, the question you're asking, which is very allied is, are all new technologies inherently a good, a positive, or is there something about a new technology that we should try and reject it from the beginning. Um, I think. I, I, I think. I, I, I think. I, I would side on the. I, I would side with the idea that until proven guilty, I would say most technologies we have to assume from our past history and experience are positive in the net. And by positive in the net, I am not talking about a very big difference. I think that if a technology can create just 1% more good than bad, that it's worth doing because of compounding interest, because 1% compounded over years and decades and is, very powerful. So, so I have a very low bar in a certain sense for what's a positive calculus on, on technology. So I, I, would, so I would say if we can show that a technology is 1% better than it's bad, then that's a net good and we proceed. And I would further say that we can't tell that in the beginning. We can't measure that difference from the start. We can't think about it and figure it out. The only way to determine that is we have to actually use it and try it and live with it and have the data from it. And, and that if after that, we decide that there isn't even that 1%, then we can do something about it. And thirdly, in our experience so far, that doing something about it, what that mostly means is giving it a different job. It's ideas are kind of weird. You can't really forget an idea or undo an idea or eliminate an idea. And uh, technologies are just ideas made concrete. And so I, technologies don't really disappear, but we can give them new jobs. And a famous example of that is DDT, uh, the insecticide, um, which was used at a massive scale to um, spray on plantations. And um, it had massive repercussions on the environment. But it turned out that if you judiciously spray DDT around households, it saved hundreds of millions of human lives a year from anti-malarial effects from, from you know, basically um, stopping malaria. And it had, had very minimal impact on the natural environment. 
so that was that was like finding a new job for the same technology. So I would say, coming back then to your question about some of these new technologies, is first of all, a um, they're innocent until proven guilty, and secondly, um, we just don't have enough time for most of them to really decide um, on their value. And then thirdly, if we do decide that some of them are not quite doing what we want, we can find new jobs for them. Great. Yeah. Um, there's one part that I wanted to key on a little bit um, in that, you know, you mentioned that these technologies are innocent until proven guilty. Um, I think one, one thing you mentioned was that sometimes these technologies that are proven guilty eventually can have different use cases. Um, and you mentioned right. how you know, ideas kind of stick around. Right. You can't really like eliminate them. They, they just are. Right. Um, I want to know kind of like what the battleground looks like before then. Like, how does it look with these, um, you know, people battling out? Is it journalism's job to battle and decide in a, you know, in a court or, you know, a, a court of the people decide whether these technologies are in overwhelmingly bad or do more bad than they do good? Or is this something that, um, say, science is supposed to do and the science, scientific process is supposed to go through? I think as much as possible, we should have um, evidence-based policy. We should base things on evidence. Journalists are not necessarily the best to gather that. They're, they're good to report that. Otherwise, they tend to report on anecdotes, uh, which we both understand is not necessarily um, the kind of evidence we need. But um, having evidence-based studies, science basically, will tell us. And um, it's, uh, it's hard to do. We should be doing more of it. And, and another important point is that we should do it constantly. So the FDA is sort of a weird holdover from a previous era of the industrial era is when you do things in batches. So the FDA will approve a drug and once it's approved, it's like it's approved. Well, we learn more about the drug once we started giving it to a lot of people. So that approval process should be a continuous ongoing process. It shouldn't be as laborious as the first time, but there should be a sense in which we're constantly vigilant and rechecking to see whether we have anything new, whether there's new evidence, whether we should change our mind about it. And so, um, and so there should be this kind of ongoing process of evaluating the technology in a scientific way the whole time, all the time. And so that's, that's a big project. That's, that's a lot of money. That's expensive. But I think um, we can afford it. And I think that's, um, there'll be many, many, many um, spin-offs from that. And, and, you know, there's a larger discussion about how we do science and how that itself is changing and needs to change. Uh, in some cases, it needs to speed up. And how do we do that? And there's some ideas. But I think, I, I, I think um, that should be a scientific enterprise so we don't fool ourselves. Journalists can be involved in communicating that, um, but it should be done in a scientific way. Sure. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I understand um, what you're getting at. And I think, you know, um, perhaps a general consensus um, is somewhat informed by the scientific process, but may also, you know, take some some notes or some ideas from, from I guess, some other, you know, fields of knowledge. So perhaps there's going to be kind of a, a you know, a deeper battleground past just the scientific process, or do you think it should be strictly scientifically? Guided? I think it should be evidence-based is all I'm saying. Evidence can come from everywhere. Certainly there's some, there's evidence in anecdotes, but it's, it, has, it has to be considered in the context. Um, and, and, and I think, um, I mean, it's, uh, when I say scientific, it doesn't, I mean, sociology, how people react, how people feel, the, the, they count. It's just that we need to measure these in, in, in a scientific way. Um, right now, a lot of our policy about technologies are based on what we imagine they might do. So it's all hypothetical. It's often very third person oriented, meaning we're not thinking about what's actually happened to us. We're thinking about what could possibly happen to somebody else. And so um, there's, it's fantasy basically. It's, it's, it's science fiction, it's speculation, which has a role, but it shouldn't really play that much of a role in making policy. 
so 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 that so that's the the issue right now is that is that we we tend to want to make policy based on sort of the worst possible things that we could imagine that might happen. That's not a good way. Got it. Um, well, maybe let me switch tracks just a little bit and go back to something you said previously in, in your first response, um, talking about sort of like the 51% to 49% split um, and how that's sort of, you know, a net good for this technology or, you know, as a reason to incorporate or, or keep this technology um, in, in the form that it is, or perhaps, you know, with some adaptations and changes. Um, I guess maybe I want to analyze your optimism a little further um, just because you're, you know, optimistic about something and, and people in general, I mean, just because someone's optimistic about something doesn't mean that you should only see the good side, right? Um, it seems more reasonable to have a grasp and understanding of both the good and the bad. Um, but perhaps in the case of the optimist, the difference is that you see the good outweighing the bad. Um, is that sort of a fair assumption? Well, and if, yes, if it is, so I, there's two yes, things. Sorry, I think one is, I, I see the good outweighing the bad by a little tiny bit. And secondly, the bad, the problems, I embrace. As an optimist, I embrace the problems because the problems are actually what propels progress. The problems are opportunities, disguises problems. They open up new territories. And what we get out of all this, you, you think, okay, 41%, 51 uh 51 49 percent it's like that's like a that sounds like a wash that sounds like break even we're not really going anywhere well here's the the thing here's what you get out of all that it isn't just the, the tiny one percent net gain what we are getting is increased choices and possibilities and that's why problems themselves are not to be sneered at or denied or in some ways even necessarily trying to minimize it's, it's because they themselves are bringing forth and forcing us to come up with possibilities that did not exist before. And so, um, so I think the, the kind of optimist that I want to be is one that fully um, acknowledges and uses problems, uh, faces problems and uses problems as a way to steer what we're doing and to increase this expansion of possibilities. And so, so yes, I, um, I, I, I think it's partly because I think they're overwhelmed by a tiny bit, but more importantly, problems are essential to the forward march of progress. Let me kind of root it back to um, AI then more specifically and and just along the same the same line. Um, what then like were you know these problems you're describing obviously that are um, maybe not inherent but either inherent or an effect of these you know um, emerging technologies. Um, what are the the negatives attending cutting edge uh, cutting edge technology sorry cutting edge technologies like AI? Um, what what are these downsides? What are these problems? that AI is facing that could be potential, um, I guess, you know, learning experiences for lack of a better term. Yeah, so, so AI, it's, it, you know, it, it's good that we're talking about AI. And, 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 and because from our limited history, we suspect, I suspect, and others, that AI is probably one of the most powerful technologies that we have ever invented and will over the long term will really basically alter everything that we do in our short experience powerful technologies will be powerfully abused okay the more powerful are the more powerful ways it's going to come and bite us and so there is no doubt in my mind that some of the biggest problems in the future will be coming from ai I also believe that most of the greatest benefits will be coming from it. I think there's a pretty good chance that those benefits will outweigh those problems by a little bit. But nonetheless, some of the biggest, deepest, gnarliest, difficult problems in the future will be coming from AI. And we can, and we humans, particularly us humans in the year 2022, are very good about thinking about all the bad ways in which you know AI can could harm us, or and and um, and, and that's just generally true throughout history. It's just always easier to, to imagine how things break 
than it is to how they get better. That's why entrepreneurs and other people are in, rightly honored because it is much, much, be, much, much harder to invent something new that works rather than to imagine how something that already exists could break. And so, and so, um, and so we have a challenge. And the challenge is, 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 is um, our heads are filled with a lot more pictures of how this goes wrong than how it goes right. It's much easier for us to imagine the ways in which we could hypothetically have disasters than we could imagining all the good ways that this could assist us. I see it as my job and the job of other people to try and bring forth some of those positive visions to counterbalance the fact that most of the visions we have of AI are dystopian. And so, um, so that's one thing is, I would say a second thing about this is that having said all that, um, and the difficulty of imagining what it is, is, is that there has never been a technology in our history where we have thought about it as much before it actually exists. All right, I mean, the number of conferences, the number of full-time people thinking about AI safety and alignment, it's just, there's billions of dollars being spent on thinking about something that does not exist yet and what we can do. That's never happened before. So some of that thinking about it is, is useful and good. Some of it is probably misspent, but of course, it's very hard to tell right now which half is which. So, um, so I'm, I'm all for thinking about, ahead, thinking ahead about the consequences and the unintended consequences as best we can. But we also have to acknowledge, and, and this is one of my important points, is that these complicated technologies like AI and others, genetics and even minor things um, are so complicated that, 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 that we can't really tell what they're good for until we actually use them. That it's only through use that we're gonna figure out their actual honest, genuine dynamics, where they actually good. And I, 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 I mean, we can think about this a lot, but, it, but, but this is what I call thinkism. This is the idea that thinking about things will solve problems. Thinking is not sufficient. Thinking alone is not sufficient. It has to be put together with experiments. It has to be put together with actual prototypes. It has to be with actual years and years of use before we'll actually know. So, so we can only do so much by thinking about things and thinking about their future and their consequences. Most of what we're going to understand about technology is going to be coming through the actual use. And that's where, again, data comes in. So, so there's, there is a good sense in which we want to think about AI and have discussions like we are right now. But we also don't want to lose sight that, that we want to kind of come back to the data. What does the data show right now so far? And to give you one example, and this is a challenge that I you know, go out to any watchers and listeners out there. And that is, is to my knowledge, um, not a single human has lost their job because of AI to date. Okay, it's like, if you say, all right, we're talking about, you know, AI replacing humans, let's talk about the data. Where is the data so far? There's a lot of AI so far. Where is the data of people losing their jobs? And as far as I can tell, there's not been a single human fired because of AI. So, all right, let's start there. So, that's where we are with AI. So, so there's, there's, you know, there, there's a lot to say, um, but let's also try and go back to the data whenever we can. Sure, I, I really like that take. And um, I think one thing you mentioned about, you know, um, us more easily being able to think about or um, anticipate the problems inherent in some of these new technologies um, or uh, compared to like the, the positives that can be inherent in these technologies, it's harder to understand what net positives will come. Um, is it the job of, you know, inventors 
engineers, um, research and development teams to basically go and explore and discover what the possibilities are for these new technologies are. And then does that get passed on to, you know, the general population, the general consumers to kind of like test it out and, and figure out how that works um, over time? Or, or how does that split kind of work in, in your mind? Well, well I mean, yes, I mean, I mean, you're right in a certain sense. If we think about the ecosystem of what I call the technium, which is the system of all technologies, technologies don't stand alone. You know, I mean, tech, AI exists because chip manufacturers are making these graphic GPUs at mass scale. There's software, there's electricity, which has to be generated to support them at massive scale. I mean, there is a lot of technologies that are all interdependent. So it takes a computer these days to make electricity, it takes electricity to make a computer and so forth. So um, there's a lot of people involved in, 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 in what we do next. And um, you know, besides the actual computer scientists and AI, there are users and users are part of that system and how they respond to something, whether they like it or don't, whether they're outraged by it, that matters. And they're a part of this system in terms of where we go with this as a society. If most humans on earth are unimpressed with AI, you know, okay, so it doesn't get used. Um, but if, you know, what, how it affects people, how it changes what they do, how it changes what they think about themselves matters. And one of the things that we also know from history is that a lot of these technologies are inevitable at the large, mm, the large scale, at the, at the large view, meaning that AI is coming. We can't really stop that as long as we keep making more stuff, but the character of the AI, who owns it, who controls it, who's accountable, do we own it? Do we have control? Who, uh, you know, do, uh, um, where, you know, what rights do we have? What responsibilities do we have? These are all things that we have a lot of choice about and that matter to us. And so kind of in addition or on top of the kind of technological progression of AI coming, we still have a tremendous amount of choice as a society to shape the character of the AI. Is it regulated or not? Who regulates it? Is it national or global um are there you know it can even be uh, regulated locally or not so 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 there's there's tons of decisions that we have as a collective group from being consumers to researchers in other fields to users um and and we have some influence either directly or indirectly on on where this goes so even though AI is technologically inevitable, the character of that AI is really up to us. Is there um, an example from history, um, from past technological innovations that could be considered with a similar scope and scale to the impact that AI is having on our times now? Uh, I think are, language. Are there lessons to be learned, basically, from, from, from our yeah. past? I, I think AI is its effect is not just like industrialization, although there is many similarities of inventing artificial power, steam power, and then later on, you know, um, oil power, nuclear power. That that was by far the big. Uh, I mean, that was I think there's that was the second biggest impact on us. The first was actually language. When we invented language, we moved from no language to language. That was the main thing that created us as humans was the fact that we had this tool called language. And um, it's so fundamental to us that we can't even imagine us before that. So I think language was the first, industrialization and artificial power was the second. And I think this third one of artificial AI um, is, going to be closer to the invention of language in terms of its actual scale of impact than even industrialization was. And um, because um, it's really infinite in its possible 
possibilities of change and directions. And so, um, and, and so, uh, you know, in some ways we could say industrialization kind of has already completed, you know, anything that we can possibly automate in terms of power has been automated, but it's hard to see how we even could complete an AI thing because we can always imagine things being smarter than they are and in having more varieties of minds. So I think the space of possible minds is very, very, very large. And that's basically what we're gonna be doing. Um, the greatest, I think, mistake in our language is talking about AI as a singularity, as a single thing, like the AI or AI, as if there's one thing, it's like the ocean. No, it's, it's like, there are going to be thousands, if not millions, of species of AIs in different kinds of minds, engineered to do different things, and very few of them will be like humans because we don't need more human minds. We just need more different kinds of minds. And there are some problems in science and business even, and government, that I think a human mind alone is not sufficient to solve. So part of what we're doing is we're making these other kinds of minds to help us solve problems like, you know, maybe it's dark energy or quantum gravity or something that we may not be able to actually figure out on our own, but working with these artificial minds of various kinds, we may be able to solve some of those problems and have an understanding. The understanding will rest not just in our minds, but in that kind of partnership mind in other words a human we may not fully understand it ourselves but with the system we can understand it enough to do stuff and so um i think that's where we're headed that's a very big strange new world where we have multiple kinds of sentience for so long we are arrived and we've been the only one with a huge gap between us and uh, even primates and living in a world where there's many different kinds of minds is, is one of the, are, are, are going to psychologically, one of the biggest um, difficulties that we're having right now. Yeah, I, I remember from your book, just a, a real long list of, you know, possible types of AI combinations, AI human combinations, um, AI, AI combinations, you know, the kind of different like layers that are possible there. And I thought that was really fascinating. So um, for our audience, if you haven't yet, definitely go and check out uh, Mr. Kelly's book, The Inevitable, um, some great pieces in there. Um, I, I think there's something sort of disrupting the AI world and the art world simultaneously right now that a lot of people are talking about that I, I sort of wanted to get into a bit. Um, and, you know, perhaps, you know, for you, you may, you may have seen this coming, you and, you know, colleagues or um, experts like you, but I think for a lot of us, we, we didn't really understand the, um, the impacts that AI art would sort of have on our, on our consciousness yeah. or, or the, the public discourse recently. So, you know, with the art world being so emphatically concerned with provenance and pedigree and authenticity, um, that, you know, this is in part because fakes and replications are ubiquitous in art. Does, what does AI bring to the table considering that? Um, in, in, with AI art, um, can AI art be considered authentic and original? Um, you know, like, what's, what's going on right now with this? Right, so, so both of us are referring to this explosion of, in this past year, of many, many, many engines that produce, um, that generate art images from, um, from a database. Um, and they're guided by a human prompt, a language prompt. So they took they took an image generating engine that had been around for a while. And they took a language models and they married them together. And they had a, a system where you could give some English words or any kind of human language words to the engine. And it would paint. It would imagine what you're trying to say based on the fact that it had digested 63 million human images with captions. And... Um, the results are very stunning and bowl over most people when they first encounter them. Um, and they raise all kinds of questions. Um, so one of the questions is, well, is it art? Is it creative? 
it's so good that maybe human artists don't have a job anymore. Um, there's questions about who owns the actual art. Is it the algorithm and the services that are hosting it? Is it the creator? What about the people whose images and work are in the database that was used to train it? Do they have any rights? And then how do you track it? And is it worth trying to unravel that? And then there are other questions about um, um, if you make variations of that thing, you know, does that count? Is that authentic? And then you mentioned Providence, which is, um, you know, keeping track of where all this stuff comes from. And then can you use it to fake? Is, is, is this another tool for deep fakes where you are um, creating something to try and fool a human? Because um, it looks like it could be done much better. So, so the answer to all these is we don't know, right? I mean, it's just like, yes, these, these are really good questions. Um, we're we're going to sort them out. And right now we can think of it. Many people have many opinions about it, including me. Um, but the honest answer is, is that um, it's going to take some while to actually have people use them, which they are using them. There's right now, by my calculation, there's 20 million images a day being generated by the four main Wow. Um, what, what, 20 million new, amazing, never before seen pieces of art, photographs being generated every day. So, um, so we'll, we're beginning to have some, some feeling about that. Um, and uh, I think I'm paying attention to this because I think that this is a rehearsal for the other, what we're doing now and what we're going through, we're kind of basically going to rehearse what happens as AI enters into the rest of our lives. Because it's not just, right now it's still images. Within the last two weeks, it's now 3D images and moving into videos and then into the metaverse where you have spatial things. And so um, that's where the superpower really is unleashed. It's not making little pictures and photographs. It's being able to fill out all the details of a of a world just with a prompt, um, and so um, that's that, that, that's that's a that, that's a that's a big thing. But the bigger thing is the fact that this is again just a rehearsal for the uh, the other ways in which music will be done and code. You know, there's a GitHub Copilot where people can these AIs can suggest and generate code based on, again, on the code that other people write. And they can fill out autocompletes. Eventually, you, you give it a little prompt, say, this is what I want, and it's writing code for you. And it's, you know, it's not as good as the professionals, but it's better than most average uh, amateurs. And so code, and then there's design. I mean, so anyway, the reason why I'm paying attention to these image generators is I see them as canaries for what's going to be coming in the future, and I think that we have a tech hype cycle, or a tech panic cycle, maybe I should call it, where we keep rehearsing through these levels of panic when, when these new technologies come along. There's just these stages that people are kind of freaked out by, and um, we need to kind of, I'm trying to help us identify, say, no, 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 this is just a panic cycle, don't worry. We're gonna go through it right now. Right now, it's like, people are kind of really frazzled by the fact that this is working and they don't want to work so well or they uh, and they want it stopped and the next stage is, is 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 they're going to say well actually it works so well that everybody doesn't have access to it you have to make sure everybody has access to it it's unevenly distributed and so anyway there's there's phases that we're gonna that people kind of go through in their panic and um we just have to learn that this is part of uh, the cycle of new technologies um, so, um, AI image generators are a thing. I think they're going to be two things. I would say they're mostly going to be used for making images where no images exist right now. It's not like they're going to replace most art. They're going to be moving into places where art hasn't gone before. They're so cheap that we're going to use them 
where we wouldn't normally use them. So in the past, we might have to find something and we can't find the exactly thing. We're not gonna hire an artist to do it. So we leave it blank. Now we're gonna, we can fill it up. We can, we can have um, art that's made contextually to what we're saying. We could have respond to our, our moods. So these are all places where we don't do art now. So now we can do art. And then secondly, it's, um, it requires a human working with the AI to actually generate really great art. And this is the surprise that people are finding the prompt artists, the prompting is an art in itself. The really great images that you see are the result of 50 steps, hundreds of, maybe hundreds of hours of people working. And so there are people who are better at, at this than others. And so the very prompting is the new art. It's like a, being a director. You're directing, you're just prompting different people. And here you have AIs working for you. And so you are directing the image. And that is the new art form. And it's a partnership with it. It's not like just pressing a button on the camera. It, you have to kind of work at this. And so those are, so this is the new art and um, a human will be for most of the, the great stuff, a partner. For the other kind of stuff, the lowercase creativity, the mundane stuff, it, it's, it's, it'll be more automatic. Um, and that's good too, because we want novelty and innovation and creativity. So we now have a synthetic creativity, which doesn't need intelligence. That's the surprise is that we can have artificial creativity without having consciousness or or intelligence. It's 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 a much more elemental force that we can package and generate and engineer, and we can put into systems. So this synthetic creativity, that's the surprise that people say, "Well, this stuff is creative," um, and that's very useful to us. And so that's a new thing. And now we're kind of practicing our absorption of this with the AI generators because it's going to come in the other AI systems as well. So perhaps you know artists. Artist programmer will be a viable occupation in the future. Yeah. Um, yeah. Prompt prompters. There's prompt books. There's a prompt marketplace where people can buy and sell prompts because they're often very hard to come up with. There are prompt whisperers who, like magicians, can just tease out things that other people say, how did you do that? I worked for hours and I couldn't get anything like that because they, under they spent 10,000 hours working with these things. There'll be ones who specialize in different ones. And so, yes, the, the prompters is, are going to be a new kind of artist. Um, I, you mentioned something earlier on in your response about this sort of emergence of AI arts and lots of questions about copyright and authenticity and provenance and trying to, trying to track those things yeah, and, yeah. and better grasp on those things. I, I wonder, you know, if we have a set of, you know, more clear guidelines or regulations in place or laws for, you know, deciphering what, who is attributed or what is attributed to copyright on something is, I want to get your thoughts on whether or not um, NFT and block blockchain technology can be the digital identifier for those digital works and whether that's a, a viable option or if there's other options that, you know, are, are more viable. Yeah. Um... You're you're in a very fast moving arena with crypto, and um, we're still figuring out. I think what crypto is good for or not. Um, again, I can kind of sit home and imagine all kinds of things that it might be good for, but it's going to be you know the street is going to determine what actually happens. I think there are certain things that we're trying to use crypto for that it may not be suited for. We might be able to do with other kind of tools including tools that haven't been invented yet. Um, but, I, but I think the idea of having an encrypted chain, like a blockchain, is a, is, is a very fundamental, you know, genius, brilliant idea. Um, you know, again, part of the issue with crypto is that it's being the real attributes and its real jobs are being obscured by the incredible amounts of money that are swirling around that really disguise 
the you know the the, the real innovations. Um, and most, to my mind, to the first approximation, most of the use cases revolve around money in some sort. Sure. If you say, well, I'm going to talk about crypto, but I'm not going to talk about money. I have to tell you, that's a very short conversation. Okay. So um, one of those possibilities that aren't money is like ID, having a decentralized way to do ID, um, tracking the authenticity of something, say in a metaverse where you have, you want to have a distributed metaverse that has interoperability and you want to be able to move something and have it appear in more than one place. We can kind of imagine using blockchain to ensure that it really belongs there and it's authentic and et cetera. But it also might be that that's too cumbersome and maybe there are better ways or maybe it's semi centralized. So um, I don't know. I don't know enough about crypto and I don't know enough about the actual real world difficulties of trying to ensure that. But um, I'm open to that possibility that this could be a job for crypto. I, I suspect that most of these non-monetary jobs are going to first be you know, played out in the metaverse, in, in, in games and metaverses, where you want to have digital assets and you want to track them and you want them to be persistent and uh, et cetera. And so um, I think that that's where I'm guessing that is. And I think, of course, I think that the metaverse is the next big thing after phones. I think smart glasses come after smartphones. So it's not, a, so this is not a trivial thing. I mean, I think this is not just about gaming as we know it today. I think that, you're, you know, I think Zuckerberg is right in one sense that I think that is the future. I think he's wrong and probably in the timing of it because I think it's uh, many years away, but I think that is where we're moving. And I can certainly imagine crypto having a role in trying to organize this in a decentralized way, which is what we want. But I'm also open to the possibility that it's too expensive or too doesn't scale, whatever it is. And so that's possible too. And maybe there's some hybrid versions of it. I just don't know enough about it. Got it. Thank you for that um, extensive response. And I, I guess maybe let's switch track a little bit um, past, past, you know, NFTs and past crypto. Um, I, I talking a little bit about um, the rise of AI um creating a useless class and this is something you know you've all know a harari and homo homo deus argues um that it's sort of inevitable that a non-productive class um that can't be employed um will will rise through um through these technological innovations especially with ai um i gotta say you know there's some compelling sides to this argument um what what do you think is perhaps the fate of human productivity in light of the productive potential of technology and do humans have purpose without it? Is you know existence alone a sufficient humanly compelling purpose? Yeah, I haven't read um, his Deus book, so I don't know the details of it. But of course, it's a it's not a new argument. Um, yeah. I think it's very misguided because um, I, I I think. I think what we as humans want to do is basically we want to do the unproductive things. Uh, I like to say that productivity is for robots and AIs. If there's anything that we want done that can be measured in a productivity way, that's a job for AI and robots. All the things that I notice that humans want to spend their day doing are things that where productivity is, doesn't matter. They want to paint all day. Like Picasso, no one's measuring how many paintings per day or square inches of paint Picasso is putting in. What he wants to do is he wants to do like one better painting a day or even in a, once in a while than you know, mediocre. He wants to improve the quality of his paintings science is fundamentally and inherently an inefficient 
process because you are making mistakes, you're having failure. Exploration, by definition, means dead ends and disasters and backtracking. Art, well, and, and even the small things of having a dinner and small talk, that's not efficient, that's not productive. So, so my point is, is, is that what happens when we give to the robots this, it's, it's like the useless stuff is what we're here for. That is the, that's the goal. The goal is to do, to be creative. To, I mean, that's what we want. We all want, we, we don't want the, the AI so that we can be more productive. We want it, it so that we don't have to work on the things where productivity matters. We want to be creative and um, inefficient in a certain sense, um, thinking about things that have never been thought before, going, doing things that don't have a name, um, trying stuff that can't be measured. That's, that's what we want the technology and the technium to support us in, is, is that we want to get away from that usefulness and we want to head directly into becoming as useless as possible. That's a, that's a really interesting take. I like that a lot. And um, I, I will strive to be as useless as possible. Cool um, and useless is my definition of art. <laughs> cool and useless. That, that means it's art. <laughs> <laughs> well, I really like that take. Um, well, uh, Mr. Kelly, I just wanted to um, have, you know, maybe one final follow-up question as we, as we sure. get up to the hour here. Um, what, what are the kind of things that you enjoy doing that, you know, can be, can be put under this useless umbrella? What are these kind of things that, you know, make us be human and feel human? What, what can people spend their time on that, um, you know, AI isn't going to do for us? If, if AI can take care of the productivity and, and the, the day of work, then what, yeah, yeah. what does it do to, to really feel alive? Yeah, I mean, this is, I, I just am completing a, um, a book of, um, a little book of excellent advice that I have been working on and uh, Penguin, Viking Penguin will be releasing in May, a little bigger size. Um, and one of my advices is like, again, don't, um, don't try to structure your day so that you're going through your jobs as fast as possible. That's the productivity. The day. Actually, Try to construct your job so you're working on something that you never want to stop working on. You want to spend as much time as possible. That's what you want to aim your day for, is not to reduce the, um, to be more efficient in the things, is to spend as much time as possible on things that you want to do. And um, what should those be? Well, again, I hinted a little bit. I think I always recommend that you try, and if at all possible, you try and work on something that's the head of the language where there's not a name for what you're doing, where you find it very hard to describe in words what it is, because that is where the future is headed towards. It's the thing that didn't exist before that we don't even have words for. That's, that's the really great thing. I mean, if you ask most people today what their occupation would, is, it would, they would make no sense to someone 100 years ago. What's a web designer? What, 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 what is that? What's, what's a life coach? What's a yoga teacher? You know, it's like, so, so you want to be working on things that we don't really have names where we don't know very much about. That's, that's a really very rewarding place. Um, even if you fail there, you will probably be ahead of everybody else. And um, uh I like to spend my time um, in a couple of things. One is, is you know, I'm, I just finished a piece for Wired on these image generators. Just literally sent it this afternoon, the final thing. And I spent six months working on it. And I spent six months of researching it, interviewing and writing as a way to force me to think about it. Because I, because like you and everybody else, it's like I see these things. Like, what does that mean? What, where is it going? Should I be concerned and should I be exuberant? What should I make of it? And for me, the only way to do that is to try and write about it. So for me, writing is a type of thinking, and I'll then share my book report to other people when I'm at the end. Um, uh, but 
it forces me to to think and so i like to try and be useful and i see my job here on earth as trying to um, articulate a positive view a, a, a future that we would like to live in a future that i would like to live in so what i'm working on and what i'm spending my time thinking about and will increasingly try to write or convey in some way maybe i'm using digital imaging maybe is is a a picture of a future with high tech and all this technology that is a future that's, that i would say yeah I, I i can't i wish i could live that long to to live there that's a future that i want to be in and um i think that that's where my optimism is operating because I think unless we can have a picture of that, it's going to be very hard to kind of arrive there accidentally, inadvertently. I mean, this kind of stuff is so complicated that it, it doesn't make sense that we're just going to stumble into it accidentally. It's much better if we have a vision of what we're aiming for, like, you know, like the vision of in Star Trek with those communicators. I, most of the people who made the iPhone had that in mind they they were aiming at that communicator just like i'm sure there's people who are aiming at you know the uh transporter whatever that was the beam me up scotty um that's that's something that people will work on for many many years and so i think having a picture of of where we would like to go is really really helpful in getting there and that's something that i'm working on well, Mr. Kelly, thank you very much for your your extensive responses today and your awesome insights as always. And we really, really appreciate having you on for the History Dow Decentralized Discourse. Um, we, we love having you on again. So I, I just wanted to ask you if there's anything else that you wanted to bring up. Yes, before. actually, could you take one minute and describe the History Dow to me um, in you know the briefest elevator pitch you can manage? Got it. Uh, that I can do. So History DAO is where the world records history and current events in Web3. So we've seen that there's um, pretty obvious flaws in the business models with the current news cycle um, and news publications. And we see that, you know, sort of like clickbait business models where inflammatory um, information or news gets the most revenue or the most advertising dollars is, is a pretty big problem. And we think that having user-generated um, content via history nfts which upload text headlines articles images videos you know eyewitness video eyewitness audio for example um, those are all things that users can record across the world as events are unfolding as they happen and mint them on the blockchain as history nfts so um, that's what we're trying to do here and we're trying to think of you know what what the new cycle and what history looks like in in the future in in blockchain nft technology and web3 and is the idea of putting them onto a blockchains primarily to um, is it you know to ensure like kind of like a date stamp, or is it is it to make them fungible or non fungible I mean, in terms of being able to be sold or um, cataloged? What tell me a little bit more about that? Yeah, I mean, you know, people are driven um, by economic incentives. And so that is one piece of, of the pie. Yeah, definitely users are able to, you know, buy, sell and trade history NFTs as well as, you know, um, the users that create the best content um, through the DAO structure will um, have their content voted up to, you know, the top of the platform, which will make them more valuable inherently. So it's up to the community to sort of like sort out by themselves what they think quality content is. And then people can get rewarded for creating content, basically recording the news cycle across the world. Um, I'd say the other side of it is that there is, you know, countless examples of historical documents being lost forever. And with blockchain technology, um, the decentralized, indelible nature of blockchain technology, we, we were looking to solve that pain point as well. But are you putting accounts right onto the chain or are they just linking like an NFT does? Um, so, sorry, what, what was the... Are, are, are you actually putting the, the, the report or the historical account onto the chain itself or are they just pointing to them off-chain like, like an NFT usually does? Yeah, that's a really quick, 
a really good question and there's you know several layers to it you know uh, as far as you know speed goes having some element that's centralized in a database um, is a little bit quicker but i think as a project evolves over time you know the most authentic and the most on-chain transparent data is going to really um, behoove us to to go in that direction okay so you, you would like to aim to putting all history onto the chain itself the yeah. full account yeah. and um and you say it's a DAO. so is it um this group that's doing this is it operating as a as a DAO right now um still in the early stages but yes we're you know um starting to starting to implement those features and what have you what has surprised you about trying to run something with a DAO? Um, what has surprised me is, um, and this is something you mentioned in your book as well, is how willing users are to um, to organize, to manage, to create, to to do things, um, even without financial incentives. So you know, if if, some, if it's something someone is spirited about or passionate about, um, they're, they're really gung ho about it, and you see a lot of really involved. Um, community members just you know for the sake of 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 their passion for the sake of the idea for the sake of you know recording history in web3 mm -hmm. okay that's really wonderful thank you for letting me know um, i'm really glad that you guys are there working on your thing um uh i'm always you know the, the idea of a DAO itself is a very broad idea and i know there's many different iterations and instances of how people are trying to manage that um i'd love to um i love if some of them would be wildly successful so i hope yours is one of them thank you very much we hope so too all righty all right thanks so much for your time today mr kelly sure. and um what's the name of your book coming up in in may what's yeah it it's called excellent advice for a living um there's 450 little bits um, somewhat similar to the ones I posted a couple of years ago on my birthday. Um, they're tweets, basically. Um, like I suggesting, you know, try to work on something that doesn't have a name or uh, one of my favorites for uh, people is don't be the best, be the only. And so um, part of what I think most people should be trying to work on is to find out, and it's very hard to find out what your particular mix of talents are because your own background and genetics have produced something that is unique and if you can find something that that you're the only one doing you don't need a resume so um not everybody can get there and sometimes it takes most of your life but you kind of line up doing something that only you can do and that's um that's really the sweet spot and um it can be all kinds of things um but if you can kind of aim your life in that direction i think um that's what the world needs a fantastic point to end on thank you so much mr kelly for your time thank today thank you for your great questions <laughs> sure i will hopefully see you next time all right <laughs> bye bye <laughs>